shares at the market. Can I get a permanent, four o'clock? Over George Washington Bridge. Connect me with the credit department. The truck's on the way now. This is the city clerk's office. They're going to operate today. Two aisle seats in the orchestra. Bring the children, too. Three o'clock at the first tee. Let me have train information, please. Big news, Jim. It's a boy. Thanks for calling. Thanks for calling. Voice of the city. For the largest city of the Western world. A city of 319 square miles under a single municipal government. Where seven million men, women, and children live and work. The voice of a complex, highly organized society representing every nationality and every human interest under the sun. A restless voice that whispers and murmurs, growls and shouts, that hopes and fears and argues and agrees, that laughs and weeps and jokes, sings through more telephones than you can find in all of France or all of Canada, as many as in Paris, Berlin and London combined, twice as many for every hundred people as in Greater London, as many in fact as there are on the three entire continents of South America, Africa and Australia. And this myriad voiced metropolis, pulsing and throbbing with life, is the heart of a great homogeneous area of 2,500 square miles. It is an area that shelters 11 millions of people with 300 separate incorporated communities, including such busy neighbors as Newark and Jersey City and three others having more than 100,000 souls. On every business day by train and ferry, a commuting army of 365,000 men and women pour into New York's offices, stores and factories for their daily labors. Nor is this all of the story, for New York's bridges and tunnels are highways for tens of thousands more. There are 150,000 daily arrivals by bus, by plane, by railroad to swell New York's own millions for a few hours, a few days, or longer. Little wonder that in this vast metropolitan area there are needed nearly 400 telephone central offices to guide the flood of conversation by wire that is caused by the ceaseless activity of the people. Within the city area alone, there are seven and one half million local telephone conversations every business day. And there are 350,000 telephone talks between the city and out of town points. All day long, the voice of the city is saying, hello Chicago, hello Atlanta, hello Boston, hello New Orleans, hello San Francisco, or London, or Honolulu, or Tokyo, or Rio. And all day long, someone far away is calling, hello there, Broadway, or Wall Street, or Fifth Avenue, or Flatbush. So it is that these central offices in the city are in reality serving Cleveland, or Omaha, or Washington, or Hollywood. And that is why Mr. Detroit often joins Mr. Manhattan, and Miss Dallas joins Miss Brooklyn, when telephone people in Baghdad on the subway invite their neighbors to come in and watch the workings of the human and technical mechanism that must function at each of these focal points that the city's voice may flow in thousands of directions simultaneously. Let's go in with a group of these visitors from near and far and put ourselves in the hands of the guides. We are first introduced to some preliminary exhibits that prepare us for our tour of inspection. They end most appropriately with one that pictures a typical big city task, the joining of the cables that stretch beneath the thronging crowds and jostling lines of vehicles and meet in manholes for the splicer's artful hands. It makes us ready to understand in a measure the significance of the basement vault, where the underground cables enter from the street with their traffic of human problems on their way to the switching mechanisms above. And we ourselves become silent as we think of the import of the streams of thought that are flowing through these arteries of speech while we stand and scan their precise and orderly arrangement. On every side, the voice of the city is roaring, but we hear it not, for it has been hushed and sealed by science in a coat of lead. And now we learn that nearly three-fourths of New York City's million and a half and more telephones are served from dial central offices. For congested Manhattan Island, the dial telephones are 87% of the total. The extent of the equipment required is a revelation as we explore the electrical wonderland that we visit next. The very act of lifting the telephone from its cradle calls the well-named line finder into service. Up go its elevators as we watch, each one rising because somewhere a telephone has been picked up. 
the lion immediately becomes ready for the familiar inviting humming signal, an electrical number, please, that means go ahead, dial. Every completed turn of someone's dial sends some part of this uncanny mechanism in search of a particular pathway for speech. We are reminded of firemen running nimbly up their ladders or rope scaling gymnasts as these electrical servants climb to their tasks. They come to rest with clicks of accomplishment that fill the room with a subdued metallic monotone that has no counterpart save in other rooms of similar function. And in this composite sound, the attendants can sense the demands of the voice that is never silent, that whispers even in the dark hours of the night that swells with a stir of life at daybreak in swift crescendo to be heard throughout the world and then slowly fades again as the city seeks repose. We also learn about another interesting problem that the voice of the city creates as it buys or sells, gives aid or summons it at the transmitters of more than a million and a half telephones. This is the problem of counting the calls that every subscriber makes. An automatic register performs this task. Each dial line has its own register, which cannot operate unless the called telephone answers. A unique camera is used to obtain readings in order that there may be photographic records of the figures. In some cities where the problem is less involved, a written record of the registered totals is made, but not in big, crowded, talkative New York. Ten registers are photographed in each exposure. But another surprise awaits us. With our minds filled with the mysteries of mechanical switching, we reach a room filled with women operators. It's news to some of the visitors that a dial office needs so many of these familiar friends. Yet here they are, and it's a vital part that they play in the guidance of the voice of the city. We pause for a moment at the busy switchboard where calls to suburban and other out-of-town points are handled and where personal help is given to those who dial for an operator's assistance. Now looking over the shoulder of Miss New York, we observe some of her varied duties. A lamp flashes before her, the signal that results when anyone dials operator. Someone wants Troy, New York, the famous upstate collar city. The details of the desired connection are recorded. The necessary circuit is obtained. The calling number is verified by the usual test to be certain that a wrong calling number has not inadvertently been given. And when conversation starts, our operator notes the exact time from the box-shaped electric clock beside her dial, which shows the hour, minute, and fractions of the minute. The lamps light again to show the conversation ended. And the operator immediately notes the elapsed time and records it on the ticket before her. It is a fraction over two minutes. Another lamp flashes, and we watch this efficient and helpful young woman dial a number at the request of someone who apparently is unable to dial without aid. It may be a blind person, or perhaps some alien unfamiliar with telephone customs in this big town. It is to help such as these that this operator and her sister operators sit at a long switchboard in every dial office. And then comes a room that is astonishing in its significance. It is one of the city's central information bureaus the place we know simply as information, our refuge when seeking numbers not in our local directories or in out-of-town points. It is a name that to some of us may have signified only an individual, but that now proves to describe a vast agency of assistance. We can understand its size, its arrangement, its function, after we realize that the very instant the telephone directory is closed for the printer, there are new numbers accumulating for which there will be called when we realize that numbers are constantly being changed and discontinued with the shifting tide of population movements. Every hour of the day brings alterations and corrections for the roster of subscribers. They must all be known to information, so the telephone numbers may be accessible at all times to inquirers who apply at this port of missing numbers. Yes, we borrow a phrase from apparatus we've already seen to describe these patient helpers, these feminine detectives. They are the human line finders for the voice of the city, the voice of any city, the voice of every city in broad, busy, bountiful America, guarded, guided by science, that thousands, millions, hundreds of millions may work and plan and hope. I thank you. <laughs>